Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. The expansion of academies or the academies programme under the current government is absolutely dramatic. Now, the Commission was asked to consider not only the impact of the programme to date, um, but also to anticipate what should happen when the majority of schools might be academies. Now, we were really clear from the start that we weren't going to engage in debate about the decision to develop the academies programme. We kept our sights on, on the future, on the promise, really, of the programme to improve education for every child. But I'm going to just outline the key recommendations and the key issues that emerge. I want to say something briefly about the changing nature um, of academies, because we do need to be clear that academies are really changing as they develop. So academies now range from the early sponsored academies set up to replace failing schools in poor areas, uh, to those established from 2010 as a result of the coalition government's decision to encourage good and outstanding schools to convert to academy status and also to extend the sponsored programme um, into primary schools. Now, many of those academies that converted since 2010, and I think it's really important to remember that they make up three quarters of all academies, um, they've become standalone academies uh, without sponsors. And there are a number of issues, I think, that you might want to pick up in discussion about those. Now, we thought as a commission that the, the, the introduction of academies has provided uh, vitality to the school system. And we're clear as a commission that they have raised expectations of what can be achieved even in the most deprived areas. At the same time, the evidence we've seen doesn't suggest that improvement across all academies has been strong enough to transform the life chances of, of, of children from the poorest families. Um, and we're saying really clearly, academy status alone is not a panacea for improvement. So it's a mistake to think that simply increasing the number of academies is sufficient to bring about the changes we need across the system as a whole. Um, autonomy and independence have to be underpinned by strong improvement strategies. And we believe there needs to be a new, a determined focus on the detailed implementation of the programme, linking it far more tightly to school improvement. Now, as a result of the work of the Commission, we identified three what we call imperatives for the development of the programme. Now, the first is a forensic focus, and we call it a forensic focus, on, on teaching and its impact on learning, <laughs> so that the gap between the vision for academies and the practice in classrooms is reduced. It was clear to us that it's that that dominates the thinking, the planning, the activities um, of the most successful academies and the most successful academy groups. Um, the evidence we saw emphasised the importance of teacher development, linked closely to a culture of classroom observation, peer learning and research. And the very best academies have a strong focus on learning. The teachers in these schools see learning from each other is an absolutely routine part of their work. These successful academies told us that if improvement is to be driven by the best knowledge, the best understanding, interaction beyond the school is vital. Schools need other schools. They need to learn from each other. So if independence is a characteristic of a successfully academised system, so too is interdependence. And it's those two things, I think, that, are, that will make the difference. The, the commissioners believe then that, that a more intensive drive to develop professional connections, collaborative activity and learning will generate more fundamental change across the system. Of course, schools work in a competitive environment and they've done so for many years. It, when I was a head teacher many moons ago, schools were highly competitive. But we don't believe it's contradictory to argue for more powerful and effective collaboration to sit alongside this. The sort of work I'm talking about is underway in, in many areas, actually, up and down the country, but needs much more momentum and a much tighter link with what's called the process of academisation. 
And the sort of things we think would support this approach are, for instance, all converters academies meeting the expectations for collaboration and school support set out in their application to convert. Uh, we think that Ofsted shouldn't judge a school to be outstanding for leadership unless it can provide evidence of its contribution to system-wide improvement. We think that an independent Royal College of Teachers, led and managed by the profession, should be established to support professional development and the better alignment of practice and research. We think that local authorities should embrace a new and a stronger role, we think, in education, not as providers of school improvement services, but as guardians, as champions of the needs and interests of children in their area. And we think that schools themselves should take on the provision of school improvement services to other schools. We're also recommending, this is slightly different from those recommendations, that the Federation of Primary Schools should be encouraged without an immediate emphasis on academy status. So the second of our three imperatives is to, increase, uh, is to ensure an increasingly academised system is fair and accessible. Now, evidence to the Commission illustrated the impressive commitment of many academies to social inclusion, but it didn't extend to all of those we saw. We heard, for example, of schools, of some academies, willing to what we call the low road to, to school improvement um, by manipulating admissions, and it's really vital that such practices are eradicated. Um, and as the system becomes academised during this transitional process, it, it becomes really necessary to make sure that one type of school is not advantaged over another. Uh, we thought parity was particularly important in relation to admissions, um, in relation to funding, for instance. The, the Commission is recommending that the Secretary of State develops a system for admissions that allows consistent and independent uh, recourse in relation to an individual academy or academy <coughs> trust acting as its own admissions authority. And we're recommending, too, that in the interests of fairness and accessibility, um, each academy should publish comprehensive data, including socioeconomic data, about who applies and who is admitted. And we think that this date, the, these data should be aggregated and analysed by the Office of the School's Adjudicator. The, the third and the final imperative is to ensure that academies de demonstrate their, their moral purpose and their professionalism by providing greater accountability to pupils, to parents uh, and other stakeholders. There has to be enough support and challenge in the system and enough uh, checks and balances to ensure academies or groups of, school, of groups of academies are able to use their independence properly. Um, the role of governors is pivotal in an academised system and needs to be given far more attention as an academised system develops. We were surprised by the number of governors who told us they felt ill-equipped to take on the leadership role expected of them in an academised system. Um, some of these governors even held legal responsibilities as part of um, uh, the Academy Trust, um, so they were in fact directors of charitable companies, and they had no understanding of their responsibilities in that role. Um, we believe that training for governors needs to be given a much higher priority, and we recognise too that the knowledge, the calibre, the independence of the, chair of the or chairs of governing bodies take on new significance in an academised system, and so we're recommending that chairs posts should be advertised, as is widely the case with other public sector roles. The, the Commission was persuaded by the evidence that it received that the greater independence of academies means they have a greater responsibility for accounting to parents, other partners and local communities. We heard this most strongly, I think, um, from very successful academy chains. And we saw a number of examples where academies actively and imaginatively engaged pupils, parents and local communities. However, some parents told us that they felt their views and involvement in the school were no longer valued once it had assumed academy status. The, the Commission believes that high standards of transparency and accountability should apply to academy change, chains as much as to academies themselves. And it's particularly important that care is taken over entry into and exit from the education market by sponsors. 
And that means this, the practice for appointing sponsors, commonly known and described to us time and time again as the beauty parade, really has to stop. Um, the, the DfE should design a selection process that's open, that's fair, that's rigorous, and supported by clear criteria. We're proposing that the Office of the Schools Commissioner is charged with producing an annual report on the comparative performance of sponsors. Finally, using the um, Education Funding Agency, the DfE should continue to tighten systems of financial accountability and trans um, transparency, and we think governors would find this particularly helpful in discharging their responsibilities. So the Commission's overriding conclusion is, is that these three imperatives, forensic focus on teaching and learning, fair and equal access, and greater accountability, if those are addressed, it's much more likely that the rapid rise in the number of academies will bring about system reform. And our vision, if you like, for a fully academised system is for a community of schools, each independent, but working together with moral purpose and with professionalism. And collaboration across this national community of schools should enable a balance to be struck between independence and interdependence with a clear aim of establishing an education system that, it, that serves children and young people in this country far better than anything has done in the past. Like many others have been watching the rapid growth of academies in the UK with enormous interest. Global comparisons like PISA show consistently that schools and high-performing education systems have very considerable discretion with regard to how they set their academic affairs and how they manage their resources. In one way, you could argue that in some of the most successful education systems, every school is an academy already today. But far less is known about the dynamics involved. That is, to what extent is actually increasing school autonomy. I also believe that the approach of awarding academy status contingent on schools demonstrating excellence is exactly the right one. What is far less clear to me, and I didn't find that addressed in the report either, is how exactly you will keep academy status tight to continue at school success. I would argue that the professional autonomy that a school is granted in the role and contribution you want that school to make to the system should always depend on its current success, not on its past. But let me turn more specifically to your remarks, Christine. I largely concur with the three conditions that you set out for the academy program to lead to system-wide improvements. I think they're exactly right. It is clear that the quality of a school system cannot exceed the quality of classroom practice. So the focus on teaching and its impact on learning will always be key to bridging the gap between the vision for academies and actually what's happening in reality in classrooms. Our data also show that teacher participation and professional development goes hand in hand with their mastery of a wider range of pedagogical practices. We see a close relationship between professional development and positive school climate, cooperation between teachers, teacher job satisfaction. And our analysis shows that effective professional development really needs to be ongoing and include adequate feedback, appraisal, and follow-up. But where is all of this going to come from? The answer is clear. In a system where schools are largely autonomous, improvement can and needs to come from the best knowledge and understanding anywhere in the system. Which makes your point that a professional autonomy goes hand in hand with a collaborative culture, with autonomous schools working in partnership to improve teaching and learning throughout the system even more salient. But I'm not sure the conditions that you've set out alone will get you there. Knowledge is very sticky. Knowledge about strong educational practices tends to stick where it is, and it rarely spreads without very effective strategies and powerful incentives for knowledge management and knowledge mobilization. Systems like Denmark, Finland, Japan, perhaps Norway, certainly Shanghai, have actually a good history of teamwork and cooperation. Schools in these countries do form networks and share resources, and they work together to create new and innovative practice. If you're a vice principal of a great school in Shanghai, and basically every school in Shanghai is an academy today, and you want to become a principal, you can get there, but only if you demonstrate before that you can take on one of the toughest schools and actually turn it around. Schools are very, very closely linked. 
If you have a school system in which knowledge is shared effectively, and you're a school with significant autonomy, on average across OECD countries, you actually do better. So the promise of academy is really holds. School autonomy in a system with an accountability culture actually does work. But on the other hand, if you are in a system without a culture of peer learning and accountability, autonomy can actually work against you. I also share your second imperative, namely to ensure that an increasingly academized system is fair and accessible to children from all backgrounds. But a fair share of the social gap in England actually doesn't lie just between schools, but within schools. That's often overlooked. And here I see that academies with greater autonomy and greater personalization have actually a very, very significant role to play. In the past, different students were taught in similar ways. Today, the challenge is to embrace this diversity with differentiated pedagogical practices. The goal of the past was standardization and conformity in school systems. Today, it's about being ingenuous, about personalizing experiences. It's about realizing that ordinary students have extraordinary talents. And I think this is where academies could actually make a tremendous contribution. Finally, I also agree with your third and final imperative, namely to ensure that academies demonstrate their professionalism by providing greater accountability to pupils, parents, and other stakeholders. There simply has to be enough support and challenge in this system, and enough checks and balances for academies or groups of academies to be able to properly use independence, as you say. The biggest prize they hold, in my view, is the shift from a prescriptive and industrial work organization of education to a truly professional work organization with the status, professionalism, and the high quality of education that go with professional work. And that is precisely what we need to expect from 21st century school systems. But I do believe that you may need to think harder about the challenges you will face along the way. And I think it's worth studying carefully how other countries have succeeded or failed in doing so. Now, to give you some context for my own perspective, <laughs> Um, I am a practitioner who has chosen to work in some of the most challenging of London schools. And I began my career at a time in, when London was one of the most competitive, divided and inequitable of secondary school systems. A time when between school variation was like a gulf in most London boroughs and where standards in some schools were breathtakingly low. <coughs> to illustrate a bit more from my experience, my second post was taken in 1998 in a school where results were 11% 5A star to C, not even with English and maths. And although tremendous gains were made in the following three and a half years, which placed that school amongst the 50 most improved schools nationally, each summer on results day, I would walk to my school from the station across a small green and encounter jubilant pupils from a nearby school where GCSE results were consistently 70% at least or more and where the socio-economic intake was radically different and where a blind girl had been refused a place there because they said they could not accommodate her needs. She happened to thrive at ours. The divisions between the schools and all that they symbolised were extremely painful on that morning each year on results day for me. Now, the situation then uh, was reversed by a policy which focused on transforming London secondary schools called the London Challenge. Now, my school, Mulberry School for Girls, is not currently an academy. We did have a full consultation uh, very early on in the policy process following the election, and the community chose not to take academy status at that point. And this was not an ideological stance. I think a diverse system in which academisation is the driving force does not have to be a divided system, competitive at the expense of children's life chances. No one wants to return to the London situation, that of my early teaching career, anywhere in this country. Therefore, I argue we should take heed of particular recommendations in this report. The support of schools for other schools in ensuring the highest quality provision for all our children, with high accountability and high support, with a fair and equitable admissions process, equal access for children to the best education we can provide, and strong governance, these have to be priorities. I am one of that group of people who have accepted the challenge of leading groups of schools. Um, the group which I represent tonight and the group with which I'm proud to be the leader is the Cabot Learning Federation, uh, which is a group of academies in Bristol, um, in Bath, and in Western Supermare. And between us, we educate just over 5,500 students. 
And the, the story of our journey is mirrored in the Commission report. Uh, I think for us in Bristol and the Cabot Learning Federation, our journey is an interesting one. I think we'll look back on this period of time in 10 years and reflect on was it academies that made a difference or was it being a federation that made a difference? And I suspect it would be a combination of two. When we set out this, we wanted to set up a model of education that would change the landscape in East Bristol forever. We wanted to build a real education learning community of staff, of students, of parents, who really bought into the notion that education in East Bristol could be the solution and not part of the problem. And more than anything else, we wanted to make sure that children in BS 15 and 16, the two main postcodes, that a parent could put their child into a reception class at the age of four, and through our academy program, we would educate them to the age of 19. Has it worked? I think it has. I think it started to work. Our challenge is to be even more consistent. Our challenge is to ensure that more students than ever succeed in the way that some of our most able students are doing. But I think it's also interesting that the school that began our journey in the Federation, John Cabot CTC, then an academy, has continued to get better as it's spread some of its good practice to benefit some of the other schools in our group. These are schools where there's been a legacy of underachievement for 15, 20, even 25 years. And we've had to work very hard to rebuild the confidence of the community in the schools. But it's starting to happen. Getting the quality of teaching right, developing that cadre of leaders who are able to make those right decisions about how we engage young people and improve the quality of education they get. How do we engage our communities and how good is our parental relationships? And my mantra is be, keep it small, keep it simple, keep it local. There are challenges with this. Uh, we've heard some of them already this evening. There is a tension between the starting point and how you genuinely create a feeling of fresh start and at the same time accelerate to rapid improvement. Christine is absolutely right. You can change the name on your school sign, but unless you do more than that, you will never change what happens inside the building. Uh, many of the children in our schools at the moment, their mums and dads went to our schools in the past and they had a negative experience. And it's very hard to win them around and explain them. By bringing them into the building, giving them the chance to observe lessons, giving them the chance to see really effective academy practice is beginning to turn that around in a way that I hope will happen when our 16-year-olds, our parents themselves in the next 20 or 30 years. Nine students from Bristol Metropolitan Academy went to university this autumn, last autumn. And they are the first nine from that site and the first nine in their family to do so. But it's only nine. We need to make sure it's 90 in 10 years' time. Nationally, I think some of the recommendations are really well crafted. The position that outstanding schools are in to help other schools is really important. And I thought I'd finish with two quotes that we're really proud of. They, they are from the Bristol Metropolitan Academy Ofsted report in May 2012. And the one on the left, which talks about almost all groups of students making better progress than their peers nationally, is something that we're really proud of. And on the right-hand side, the final sentence where it talks about the work of the Federation, where it clearly shows the burgeoning community of practice that is helping to sustain the Academy's good improvements, is something that we think is uh, part of the legacy we will leave for students and young people in the future in Bristol. Given the emphasis that we've heard from you and from Andreas and from David as well particularly on kind of collaboration, collaboration and federation, the kind of sense that schools that are on their own, isolated, either not passing on their strengths or not learning from others in terms of their weaknesses, how authoritarian, as it were, how directional do you think policy should be in driving federation, collaboration between schools? We, 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 we did discuss this um, as commissioners and we didn't always agree um, on this. I really don't think this can be imposed. Um, I, I think one of the strengths, actually, I never thought I'd say this, one of the strengths of what's going on now is that it's permissive. Schools uh, have got enough that's top down and, and, and it forced on them. But the, the model that's been um, really uh, developed, as a lot of it has been school to school support. I see uh, part of the future in good schools, outstanding schools, or all schools working together and actually not passing something on, but together developing something and creating something. We're very aware of broader debates, and as Christine says, there's been some debate among ourselves um, about the issue around 
necessary leverage around collaboration in a competitive system, and particularly given the very strong model of accountability we have and the drivers of accountability. Um, so really getting this balance right, not being top-down, trying to um, develop a culture of school-to-school -school improvement and collaboration, but in a competitive system, I think is one of the, the big challenges. And again, um, Andreas's uh, global insights are really helpful here, I think. Who is it who's best to drive that? And, and there is a tendency, isn't there, in all these conversations to focus on school leaders. But I wonder whether school leaders are always the people who are most incentivized to foster collaboration and challenge. In some ways, they might be the most defensive and the least inclined. Uh, there, is a, there, there is a within school dynamic about improvement that we need, that is very much about school to school support. But there are some limits to what school leaders can do. School leaders cannot substitute for school place planning. School leaders cannot substitute for um, accountability to, the, to, to, to and with their community. So I think that, yes, we need to support school leaders. It cannot all be driven from within the schools. And the incentives are not just badly lined up for schools, they're also badly lined up for local authorities, who at the moment, in too many cases, are still both provider and auditor. And uh, recommendations on local authorities and school improvement are quite deliberately intended to get the incentives lined up for local authorities to focus on what is best for children in their community.